it's a pleasure today to have uh, Professor Charles Brown. Uh, he's a senior specialist uh, with the Ellen M. Uh, Voches Transportation Center uh, and an adjunct professor at uh, Rutgers uh, University. He has over uh, more than over than 12 years of public and private sector experience in urban and regional planning, policy and research, and uh, also has an extensive experience working with municipal and county and state government agencies for for-profit and non-profit organizations mm -hmm. uh, in several states in the US. And his work focuses on uh, livable streets and healthy communities. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And please, you can start sharing your, your screen. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we can see the screen very well now. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Charles T. Brown. Um, as I stated early on, it is, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with each and every one of you here today. Um, I would like to start by thanking uh, McGill University for having me here. I'm honored uh, to follow those who have come before me as part of this transport uh, seminar series. Today, I will be discussing equity matters, creating safe, healthy, and inclusive places for all. But before I do, I would like to self-identify. Um, first and foremost, I am known affectionately in many circles as a pracademic, given my combined professional experience as a private and public sector planner, and more than of a, a decade of experience working within and with academic institutions from around the country. Similarly, I'm unapologetically a street level researcher uh, because I strongly believe that the solutions and answers to many of societal problems lie with the people, those in the literal streets. Therefore, it is imperative that we, the so-called experts, move from behind our computers and get out and interact with the people. And by people, I'm referring to all people. Many people ask, why do I focus on centering race and ethnicity within my presentations? Well, I have chosen personally to prioritize the race conversation and transportation equity in order to broaden the narrative of transportation planning. I am strongly committed to leading and centering race in all transportation decision-making processes because too often race is glazed over in planning, research, and policy development. And thus it makes assumptions about the communities we are tasked to serve. Instead, what you see too often, unfortunately, is proxies such as income, age, sex, gender, education, and access to vehicle being used as an, as an alternative to avoid centering race-based issues. And so the history of structural racism, particularly in the US, is public policies, is institutional practices and social norms that together maintain this racial hierarchy and its impact across the country and within the communities is often overlooked and unacknowledged. Yet, if you're familiar, it is very pervasive and unmistakably harmful to everyone. And so the social marginalization and the inequities that racism cultivates in housing, education, employment, the built in social environments and healthcare are felt across generations, most acute, acutely though among black indigenous people of color. So because of this, I recognize that systems of cultural oppression and racism need to be acknowledged and repaired by the entities that helped create them. And so as planners, as engineers, as real estate professionals, et cetera, we have a professional and a moral obligation to acknowledge that the uneven development of cities and the resulting racial health, uh, racial health and wealth disparities are the result of systemic racism ingrained within the planning profession, as well as the other professions really just pick one. And so what is equity? 
there are three ways in which I like to introduce the concept of equity. First and foremost, equity involves trying to understand and give people what they need to enjoy full, healthy lives. You poll an audience, nine out of 10 people will probably agree with this statement. However, once you start to push or ask for a deeper understanding of equity, particularly around the fact that equity is the presence of justice and fairness within the procedures, the processes and distribution of resources by institutions or systems, then some people start to push back for personal or political reasons. But I'm here to tell you equity work requires that you go even deeper. See, when you're doing this equity work in the context of transportation, it really requires an understanding of the underlying or the root causes of inequality and oppression within our society. So this isn't just about putting on an equity lens. This is about being foundational in your understanding of how we got to where we are today. But it doesn't end there. It also requires a consideration of the social identities that are at play within society, whether we're talking about race, age, sexual orientation, ex ethnicity, physical abilities, disabilities, et cetera. So it then forces you to think about a series of the, a series of questions from which identities do you think about most often to which of these identities have the greatest effect on how you, how others perceive you. In the context of these social identities, the ones I think about most often obviously are race, ethnicity, and also gender. But in my work, of course, I, believe that I have an obligation to consider all of these identities because they shape who we are as individuals and as a collective. And so why is this important? It's important because many of you want to do what is right. You're focused though on what's seen and you're not focused on what's unseen. And to make the point, I present to you a photograph from the West Ward of Newark, New Jersey. This is a photograph that I usually use on the first day of my class in transportation uh, planning at Rutgers. I ask my students, as a transportation planning mobility professional, which changes would you like to see in this photograph? And of course, I invite you to do the same. Please type in the chat which improvements or changes you would like to see. As you can imagine, many people will start saying, where are the trees? Where's the greenery? Where's the pedestrian scale lighting? We need side where, sidewalk repair. Where are the bike lanes? There's a need for rehabilitation, redevelopment of properties. And then there's a need for benches for persons who are seniors to sit and others. There may even be a need for a bus stop or a bus shelter here. That is what most people observe when they're looking at this photo. However, what most people overlook are people Eight out of 10 people fail to say, where are the people? That is the question because this is why we do the work that we do. We do the work not only to make sure that the environment is healthy, but the work that we do in the transportation and mobility space is all mm -hmm. about the people. And this is important because transportation has been historically and even in contemporary times, weaponized as a tool of oppression within society. Now, I wouldn't say that without evidence, and the evidence shows that in city after cities across America, highways that were built to appease white suburban commuters and enabled through eminent domain and funds from the 1949 Housing Act and the 1956 Interstate Hi Hi Highway Act, excuse me, were shoved through these areas, causing blight and pollution. Among the Black neighborhoods that were divided was historic Treme in New Orleans, the Brooklyn area of Charlotte, and the Overtown community in Miami. But in fact, follow the highway system anywhere across America and you will find the same outcome. And no, in many cases, these were not unintended consequences. In fact, a highway lobby, lobbyist by the name of Alfred Johnson said in an interview that some city officials in the 1950s or mid 1950s they stated that the urban interstates would give them a good opportunity to get rid of the local nigger town. Now, that is an intended consequence of the highways used to oppress and harm people. 
And if you follow transp transport and mobility, you know there's a direct connection to the climate crises. I was both fortunate and unfortunate to have witnessed not only Hurricane Katrina that hit Mississippi in 2005, but Hurricane Sandy that hit New Jersey in 2012. Unfortunately, though, the harm caused from these inequities in transport and mobility also causes traffic violence. And those who are most at risk tend to be older adults, people of color, and people walking in low-income communities. When you look at older adults, those with a relative pedestrian danger of those age 50 and, and above had more than a third uh, higher than the general population relative pedestrian danger index, meaning that they were more likely to be struck and killed by a car than their counterparts. And then when you look at people of color between 2008 and 2017, Black and African Americans were 72% more likely to have been struck and killed by drivers. And then lastly, what we know from an income standpoint is that persons living in neighborhoods where the median household income is 36,000 or less, they were killed at much higher rates than their counterparts. Now, you may not identify as a person of color. You may not be 65 years and older, but if you've traveled or anywhere within the US, the likelihood is that you've gone into a community that has a medium household income of 36,000 or less. So at a minimum, one should gather from this the need to empathize with those being victimized by traffic violence. Thankfully, we've seen public health shift to a framework that recognizes these inherent connections. They've gone from recognizing and acknowledging not only that the risk behaviors lead to disease and injury and unfortunately uh, early mortality, but they're also sort of starting to point to the connection between the social inequities in its relationship to the institutional inequities and then the living conditions that manifest from that bi-directional relationship and thus leading to the risk behaviors that we see in these communities. So if you are in a black, brown, low income community and they say the environment made me do it, there is a reason to believe them, but it doesn't stop there. Here's a map of Seattle, Washington. And what I want you to do is type in the chat as I ask this question. If blue represents where whites live in Seattle, green represents where blacks live, purple represents where Hispanic live, and the pink and other colors represents where Asians and other live, what do you see in Seattle? Seattle is one of the most diverse cities in all of America. But the question is, what do you see? Let's not throw pick on Seattle, let's move to Tampa. Again, if blue represents where white lives, green represents where black live, purple represents where Hispanics live, what do you see? Of course, it wouldn't be fair to stop at Tampa. We should go to Detroit, Michigan. Again, if blue represents where white live, green represents where black live, purple represents where Hispanics live, what do you see in Detroit? Of course, it wouldn't be fair to stop in Detroit. We should go to Houston, Texas, one of the largest cities in all of America. Again, if blue is white, green is black, and purple is Hispanic, what do you see in Houston? Of course, many of you start saying now, maybe we get it, maybe we don't. Well, to really illustrate the point, let's go a little further. Let's go to Atlanta, Georgia. If blue represents where whites live in Atlanta and green represents where black live, what do you see in Atlanta, Georgia? The quote unquote black Mecca in the United States. But it wouldn't be fair to stop there. We have to go to the nation's capital. So let's go to Washington, DC. Again, if blue represents where whites live, green represents where blacks live, purple represents where Hispanics live, what do you see? Now, many of you would say there are exceptions to this rule. Well, are there? Let's go to New York City. New York City, as you know, is again, like Seattle, the most, if not one of the most diverse cities in all of America. But again, if blue represents where whites live, green represents where blacks live and purple Hispanic, what do you see in New York? Now, by this time, most people ask, is there again an exception to this rule? Of course, there's an exception to this rule. Portland, Oregon, and many other places like it. If blue represents where white people live in Portland, green represents where black live, purple represents where Hispanics live, what do you see in Portland? Hopefully what you see is racial residential segregation, but don't stop there. 
you see racial residential segregation that is by design. And so public health space in the public health field is starting to recognize then that one's race determines one's place, which determines one's health. And so history, unfortunately, doesn't say goodbye. History says, see you later. And so what we know is that there's currently um, a political contest going on that's very important in a place like Georgia. And Georgia just so happens to be the sixth most dangerous state for pedestrians in the nation. Many of the others I've shown you also are in the top 10 as well. But the question becomes then, how can we create a safe, equitable, and inclusive system for all? So what I'm going to do is provide to you a framework that was done by Dr. Seth Lowe. And this framework talks about distributive justice, procedural justice, interactional justice, representational justice, and care. So when you look at distributive justice, the question one must ask is, who has physical access to the street, to the park, and to the trail? And when you look at the who, it's important in the context of transportation equity to disaggregate the who among racial and ethnic lines. Is it black and brown who have access? Is it white who have access? That's a very important question to ask. You must also look at it in terms of the different modalities. Do you only provide access for the car, for the bike, the bus, or the pedestrian? Because my research shows me that in the context of many minority neighborhoods, most of their um, respondents to a survey that I did do not feel that their children are safe from traffic when bicycling in their neighborhoods. And then when we looked at who could safely bike to local parks or trails from their homes, only or less than one in four felt that they could safely bike to the local parks and trails. Why is this important? Because many would say that there is an adequate supply of parks and trails in these communities. Well, what you know, based upon what you see here, is that that proximity is not access. Access is more than even the physical. It also has a lot to do with the social. Once you've looked at distributive justice, it's important then to move to procedural justice and answer the question, who has influence over the design, the operations, and the programming? This is important because in the American context and also other places, what you find is that minority youth are uh, not included in many of the planning and transportation decision-making processes. This is problematic for many reasons, but one of the main reasons why it is problematic is because these are the very population that find themselves, unfortunately, victims of pedestrian and vehicle crashes. Then you must move into interactional justice, which asks the question, what makes people feel welcome or unwanted in a space? If you've been following the news here in the US, you may or may not know that African-Americans are two and a half times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. And when you look at gender differences among them, what we find is that black males in particular reported being stopped at a rate seven times that than females. And so then when you move from that uh, form of justice into representational justice, you must ask the question, do people feel their experience and their history is represented in the space. And why is this important? Because as we, go up, as we go about improving the mobility for people in spaces across North America, what happens too often is historical and cultural erasure that takes place in these communities, particularly communities of color. And then lastly, moving into care. Once we've built it, we must maintain it. So we must ask, how do people demonstrate their care for the space and other people in it? It's one thing to build it, it's another thing to maintain it. And once that thing is built and maintained, it's not just about that thing, it's also about the people in it. So we must exercise the same level of care for the people that are present in it as we do the environment. Because my research has shown, and other research has shown, that our systems have been historically biased against women, sexual minorities and does not protect religious minority groups as well. And so you may ask then, what are some examples of projects I've been involved in that has successfully integrated this equity infused approach? 
One of the projects is the Less Ride JC Bicycle Master Plan that we developed for the city of Jersey City in New Jersey. If you're not familiar with the city of Jersey City, it has a population of around 265,000 people. And in that particular project, from the beginning, we made sure that equity, racial equity, was a foundational and cornerstone element of this project. Every decision we made centered around who had access and who did not. I'm proud to report that in that plan, we have a 10 or a 12 step equity action plan that is leading to ensuring that equity is at the heart of the transportation decision making that is happening in that city. And fortunately, this wasn't just a plan that sat on the shelf. On the, shelf. Um, the city of Jersey City has been working tirelessly to actually implement many of the goals and actions that were in this plan with equity in mind. A second project I worked on was around a tactical, tactical urbanism project in the city of Trenton, New Jersey. The city of Trenton, New Jersey has a population of around uh, 84,000 people. And we were brought into this community because there were some problematic intersections where cars were speeding, pedestrians couldn't safely cross to and from one side of the road to the other, particularly to get to uh, social services, the local schools, et cetera, along that corridor. So we all came together collectively from transportation, from health, from environment, from bicycle and pedestrian advocacy groups, et cetera. And we developed a mural that was placed uh, along this corridor. As a research institution at Rutgers, we did before and after interviews. And what we found is that the overwhelming majority of people agreed that the mural led to decrease in speed and overall safety and mobility for the pedestrians there. And then lastly, a similar project occurred in the city of Asbury Park in New Jersey, which is much smaller than the others. It has a population of 16,000. They too had a very problematic intersection we used a sort of equity infused approach to interact with the locals there. This resulted in, again, a tactical urbanism project, a mural at a very dangerous intersection. We conducted pre and post surveys. Again, we found that overall residents, motorists, bicyclists, others were happy with the improvements that it led to an overall decrease in speeding and an improvement in pedestrian and bicycle safety. But you can't stop there, you must move to the inside, the internal, and that's what you must advocate for equity strategies. And one of the things that you can advocate for is for an anti-racist value or culture. We must ensure that the culture changes in order for the products and the projects and programs that we create reflect that change. In doing so, we should advocate for racial equity action plans, equity trainings within these institutions, the development of equity performance measures, the development of an internal equity working group to hold the organizational accountable, and then the development of an external equity advisory group to make sure that they're holding the internal group accountable and making sure that the needs and the concerns of the community are addressed. And then lastly, once you move internally, it's about implementing and institutionalizing equity in a way that increases the mobility, the safety, the health and welfare of all residents. And the way that you do that is by advocating for racial, modal, procedural, language, gender, spatial equity and basic common sense. So here are a series of actions you could do right now working with your municipality, your county, or your state government to ensure that all forms of equity are included in the transportation decision-making process. And so action number one, commit to equity through the adoption of a racial equity action plan. I love what the city of Oakland, California is doing around ensuring that they advance equity in the way that they would like, through, like to through their racial equity action plan. If you are looking for an example, I would point you to their plan. But this shows your commitment to changing things, not only from a modality standpoint, but from a racial equity standpoint, because all the data points to the fact that one's race determines one's health, which I mean, one's race determines one's health outcome, I should say in short. 
And then we should look at action number two, which is about prioritizing investments and in maintenance in minority and low income communities. And that infrastructure and investment should be around pedestrian and bicycle improvements. And once we put them there, it's not enough to just build it, we must maintain it as well. And then action three is making sure that procedural equity um, is at the forefront. And so this is about ensuring the full and fair participation of racialized minority groups, because as you know, too often, they are left out of, again, the transportation decision-making in their communities. And if you follow environmental justice principles across the US, you One know can. that it is about avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating disproportionate, high, and adverse human health and environmental effects, including social and economic effects on minority and low-income populations. But it's also about preventing the denial of, the reduction in, or significant delay in the receipt of benefits by these minority communities as well. And because many of our communities are extremely diverse, people speaking multiple languages, it's important that you foster more equitable treatment of these diverse languages in the public sphere. To not do so is to not recognize and appreciate the diversity that exists within your community. And then building up on that, it's important that we start to document and increase our understanding around the mobility and access for different populations, starting with the elderly and persons with disability. And of course, when we say disabilities, we're not talking just about the physical disabilities. We must also recognize the cognitive disabilities that exist and then design our, our transportation and mobility spaces in a way that um, recognizes these human rights. And then we must go to engaging with women to deepen, their under, to deepen our understanding of their behavior and usage differences as well. This is important because when you look in the transportation, the planning profession, what you find is that women are unfortunately underrepresented. And what you get is an environment that is designed through a male citric lens, ignoring the needs and concerns of women. So we must engage with them separately and the same for our foreign born populations. Again, to engage with, to understand so that we can, you know, hopefully, uh, develop plans that takes into consideration each of our uniqueness. And then while we're doing all this, we should proactively work against the fact that gentrification and displacement may result from it intentionally and unintentionally. Regardless, we should evaluate and mitigate the unintended consequence of this improved mobility and access. Because what we know is that trees planted in minority communities mature just in time for gentrification to take place. And then to sort of conclude here, um, it's not enough to end there. We must also look at the policies, the sort of racialized zoning and land use practices and see the ways in which they've impacted both past and current um, transportation decision-making, uh, how they've led to uh, unaffordable housing, et cetera, is all connected. And then lastly, um, it's important as transportation and mobility professionals that we work with law enforcement to safeguard against discriminatory enforcement, particularly around over-policing black and brown and low-income populations in North America. And so I would like to then close with a quote. This is a, a quote that I use to kind of center um, my energy and to sort of reinvigorate me each and every morning around the work that I do. And this is a quote by Dr. Cornell West. And he states, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. So I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for your time. Here's my contact information. I do answer my phone. I respond to emails. If you'd like to chat about any and all things around the built environment, I'm here for you. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Charles. Uh, that was very good. That was an eye-opening talk, really. Um, okay. So I'll be reading um, some of the questions that uh, the students posted uh, and, and uh, people uh, sent. Um, so 
one of the, the students who's helping in, in writing the in, in, in organizing the seminar is saying uh, uh, Professor Julian Adaman, who talked last week, and I know you know him in uh, in person. He talked about how transport justice needs to be addressed to not only physical infrastructure but also social infrastructure. Um, so, uh, what other piece like? And then he talked about an example of uh, of policing in uh, and systems and security in in that. So, what other aspects in terms of social infrastructure that you think we should be taking care of or concentrating on uh, in the forefront of our thinking of transport justice? Yeah. So, I'm putting in the uh, chat right now a hashtag. And that hashtag was on the cover slide of my presentation. It's called hashtag arrested mobility, arrested mobility. So I am currently working on a book about arrested mobility. Arrested mobility is a theory that um, Black people in particular um, have been over policed via policy, via polity, and via policing. So there are three forms of policing that happen. It happens via law enforcement, which we'll call policing. It happens via policy, the racial residential segregation that you saw that was by design, or the uh, use of highways to um, um, basically destroy Black, Brown, and low-income communities. And then polity will be P-O-L-I-T-Y, is where you have this Seth uh, deputization of white citizens in America who police the behavior of black and brown people uh, in addition to policy and policing. So this idea of arrest and mobility gets at the social as well as the physical ways in which we or our mobility has been arrested. And so that's a theory or an assertion that I put out there in the student and doctor, you know, Eggerman, of course, is very correct that it's more than the physical because there are beautiful infrastructure in place all across this country, but people still don't feel safe walking there due to the social environment. And so as mobility experts, transportation professionals, we must get out of just focusing on that built environment piece and then think more holistically about the social piece too. Um, Sayana Sharif was, was taking the, the class and she's now sitting in India. Uh, she's asking, what are the some of the deterrents to public investments in colored and slash racialized mm. neighborhoods? So that is what a deterrent. Yeah, there, that is a result, unfortunately, of uh, structural or systemic racism. Okay. Um, that's why you have not only underinvestments but disinvestment or the lack of investment period in these communities. Um, the sort of decision making bodies and frameworks that we have in place don't center or prioritize, me, prioritize, uh, excuse me, uh, the importance of racial equity. And so what you find is that the, um, the outcomes remain the same because the systems for assessment and then the distribution of these resources have not changed in decades. So what we're advocating for in the mobility and justice space is that these decisions be centered through a racial justice lens because it is one's race and one's income most often that is determining where these resources are going and which groups are receiving them. And that of course manifests from uh, four forms of racism, the cultural, the interpersonal, the personal and the systemic. And so it's a big battle, but how do you eat an elephant one small bite at a time? Um, a question uh, from Koli Kleeson, she uh, is asking about what are the actions we can take in the context of where our political leaders are refusing to, rec to recognize that uh, systemic racism exists or the existence of oppressions. How do you deal with that? Well, well like the leader himself is refusing, saying, no, there's nothing, everything is okay. Yes, well, the way that you fight ignorance is with evidence. And so what we are all very skilled at is uh, recognizing and downloading the data that makes the point. Um, and so what you do is you, you can't spend all of your time, um, I, I would say, focus on those who are ignoring 
that this form of oppression exists. What you have to do is fight for this as a human right in the context of the US, both a human right and a civil right. And then you should show through the use of data how people are being oppressed by these decisions. And of course, there will be people who will still disagree, but it's about spending your time working with those who are in agreement and hopefully at some point, um, that synergy and that energy among you will rise to the attention of those in power who are ready to heed your advice and then act accordingly, but yeah. never give up. Yeah. Let me ask you something. Um, that's a question for me <laughs> about your personal experience as a planner. Okay, so I want you to, like you showed us a couple of your projects. I want you to tell us what were some of the actions you did or something that made you think like, yes, I got to try it this time. Or, or this is what I got to try it in this project. I was doing it not as well in the previous project to, to make sure the equity component is incorporated and is part of the, uh, uh, when you're doing, especially the, the, the you know, when you're pin, pinpointing a problem and, and fixing something on the ground. So as an experienced planner, uh, more than, like step aside uh, as an experienced planner, look what, what were the things that we should, that opened your eyes that you felt this is how it's done. I was doing it not the best before. Well, one of the things I would say that I wasn't doing well before when I started my career was being my whole self. And what I mean by that is I am underrepresented in the planning profession, meaning black males. Uh -huh. And I had been socialized, I would say, to ignore the disparities that exist among the different race and ethnic groups in the context of planning. And so early on my, in my career, because I was probably like everyone else, I was trying to keep and maintain a job. I wasn't speaking about the inequities and the disparities that were ever present before me. But then there became a time when it makes it very difficult to sleep when you see something that you know you should address, but you may not have had the courage to do so. And so what I had to quickly do is make sure that I was being myself. I was, I had the courage to speak out when necessary, regardless as to how uncomfortable it made others feel. Once I became comfortable making everyone else uncomfortable, I started to see that many people, because you're providing the evidence to support the oppression, many people became very open to those ideas. And so now what I do as I've grown in, in life and as a professional, I make sure that every project I work on centers people. Place is important, environment is very important, but we do this work that we do for the sake of people. And so when I start a project, I make it very clear that this is about people. And when we say people, we must look at people for their, their similarities as well as respect their differences. So this is a, not a one size fits all approach. You must do the work to recognize the differences and then come up with solutions that addresses the needs and concerns of those differences. And so that approach now has been very successful for me. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why I'm talking to you here today, because I've made a conscious shift to not be cowardice, but to be courageous and to advocate for all people. And this is supported by, as a planner, um, my ethics, which say that as planners, we are to advocate for social justice in our work. And so what I'm doing may seem unique, but it's really something that we all can do if we have the courage to do it. That's a very good answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there's some, um, uh, so, so Abdul Rahman, Abdul Hamid or Abdul Rahman, I can't see the name exactly. Abdul, uh, ha, uh, Abdul Rahim Hamid, he's asking, um, so you have worked in different um, cities with different uh, municipalities and uh, like political backgrounds. Did you f see any kind of, when you're trying to put equity at the forefront, did you see any kind of uh, 
differences between the parties, where the background of that person is, like, so he's a Republican, he's democratic, or he's from the Green Party or whatever that you're talking about. Does that, is it different in, in terms of how they are accepting equity or trying to incorporate equity in their policies? Well, there, of course, there are always differences in how people um, hear the message that you bring around equity, equality, justice, uh, et cetera. What I tend to do is to not focus on the political party of the person I'm engaged with. And what I do is put before them a, a moral imperative, which is, are you willing to center the needs and the concerns of all people? Um, I, what I think and what I found is that both parties understand why that's important. Because what you have is not just black and brown people being killed on our highways as a result of our decisions. And of course, chronic diseases being, you know, quote unquote, through the roof here. Um, all people care about the environment and they care about the people living in it. Where I've seen the disconnect is when you start talking about the approaches to um, modal equity. And should we prioritize the vehicle over the car or over the bike um, or over, um, not, not the car, I mean, should we prioritize the car over the bike or over public transit or more biking and walking infrastructure? So those are the differences you, you would see. And the differences have a lot to do not only with uh, political parties, but also um, spatially or geographically within the US in the Southeast which is very car centric, is much more difficult to convince some people that we should be prioritizing investments in walking and biking and public transit. In the Northeast, it's not as difficult. Um, sure, the political lines correlate somewhat to the geographical lines as well in the US, but that's not always the case. Of course, again, I enter the conversation, focus on people. If they try and take the conversation elsewhere, uh, we can have that conversation. I do have to make compromises, uh, but what I don't compromise on is again, centering people. Uh, Costa is asking a question is like uh, about gentrification. Usually when we do transportation plans or when we implement something on the ground or a major transport infrastructure, it always brings change to the neighborhood. And when you start planting the trees, as you mentioned in, in your talk, uh, they start, growing and being nice at the time when it gentrifies when you are planting trees in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in some neighborhoods. So, so the question is, what are, like, do you have examples? How can you like, uh, put a break on the gentrification? Because you have to invest in neighborhoods. You have to upgrade them. So what is the solution? And uh, the, the second part of his question was, are there any kind of projects you have seen that were like led to less gentrifying than others? Yeah, so what I'll do is um, instead of providing examples of projects, I'll answer the question of how to mitigate the unintended consequence of gentrification and displacement. First and foremost, I think it's important that we recognize right away that there's a distinct difference between gentrification and displacement. Uh, when we talk about gentrification, the movement of higher incomes uh, usually people that are racialized as white into a lower income area with people who are primarily racialized as black and brown. That's usually what you see uh, as gentrification. That by itself isn't the issue. The issue is that that movement results in displacement of people as well as the cultural of that place. I talked about the need for representational justice and the need to not have cultural erasure happen. And so the ways in which you can kind of fight to that depend on which stage of gentrification or displacement you find yourselves in. The reason why I say that is because the distinction is because we don't want to pathologize the people. The people who are brown and low income want the same investments in their community as the people who are higher income and white. The problem is the trees planted in those communities mature just in time for gentrification to take place. So what they perceive as a benefit, unfortunately, is scarred based on the repeated uh, history of gentrification following it. So again, going back to how do you address it, it depends on where you are in the process. If gentrification has not happened, a number of things that, there are a number of things you could do, such as 
you can already start developing um, these coalitions. So do some coalition building to make sure that you're proactively working against gentrification happening in your community. So getting together with partners of similar mind uh, and, and building the sort of infrastructure and foundation to fight the war that's ahead. You also can develop or work with community land trusts. You can advocate for inclusionary zoning. Um, you could talk about the limited equity co-op housing, and you could start developing what you see as um, a precursor to a community benefit agreement so that you can have a series of ask in place for when developers come, these are the things in which the community is advocating for. That's before gentrification gets there. Let's say, for instance, you find yourself within the early stages or the mid stages of gentrification. What you want to do is you want to strengthen rental protections. You want to look at uh, tax abatement policies. And then you really want to protect against your condominium conversions and then advocate for funding for the support of rehabilitation and the preservation of your existing housing stock that is already affordable. And then lastly, if you're in this late stages of gentrification, perhaps what you do is get with businesses and advocate for employer assistant housing. Uh, you establish a sort of affordable housing trust fund, and then you start dealing with NIMBYism, not in my backyard, ism. So those are some things you could do. I'm just collecting them. <laughs> and I just want to add, I'm a transportation mobility expert, not a housing expert. But in my readings, those are some things that I found to be effective against mitigating the unintended consequences of gentrification and displacement. Uh, Anastasia, who's, who's uh, helping uh, in, in, in the question she has been asking, uh, how can uh, intersectionality uh, be accounted for uh, with design? Do you think uh, heterogeneous minorities such as Latinos or communities face particular challenges in terms of policy making? Yeah, so the way that it can be integrated or acknowledged within our profession is one, you have to speak up about it. Uh, you, see, you saw that I made a very conscious effort to talk about inter intersectionality after I gave you a sort of overview of my equity principles. So intersectionality um, is important because for some of us, our identities are assigned due to the social political spaces we operate in. People tell you, for instance, based on the color of my skin, that I am black and I am male. We know that that's not who I am holistically or in totality. I am also a father. I am a husband. I am ex-military. Um, I am a world traveler. Um, I seek to speak multiple languages. I hope to one day. Uh, I care about persons with disabilities. I care about sexual and religious minorities. And so when you bring that sort of framing, regardless of your personal background, this is about your personal and your professional, you're able to then have a lens which considers the entirety of humanity. And so when you're viewing these projects, you're able to view them through that lens. And that's the lens in which I approach all of my projects. And that lens is not, in, not just important from a personal standpoint, but the data supports it from a professional standpoint. Again, how do you address ignorance with evidence? Uh, the last question comes again from uh, Abdul, uh, Abdul Rahim Hamid. And um, he talks about the current political weather. Uh, and how he's asking, uh, in terms of working towards transport justice, has the current political weather imposed, imposed any extraordinary hardships beyond the normal? Yes, in terms of the current political weather, it matters where you reside. Where I reside, there's a lot of sunshine. There is a lot of beautiful uh, transformative days. And I'm speaking metaphorically. And what I mean is that my current political reality is one that we are constantly fighting for the need for greater transportation equity and justice in these processes. 
Yes, I can travel to and through many a places where the weather isn't as beautiful. And in those spaces, you have to be prepared with your umbrella. And your umbrella is the lens through which you see humanity and the courage that you're willing to take to center that humanity. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna get rained on, but it does mean that you're protecting the rights of people, whether they're civil or human, no matter where you go. So this is much more about you as a person than it is you as a professional. Me, the way I approach it is I don't separate the two. What I do is I walk into my profession as the person I am. So if you want to become better at your job, whether it's social, whether it's politically or otherwise, change inside and then you can change outside, regardless of the weather. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you for, for the talk and for the questions and for your time. It, it has been a pleasure to have you with us and uh, hopefully we'll bring you back one day in person to McGill. Yes. Uh, to, to, to give a talk for us in person and, uh, and spend more time with us. Thank really you too. It and it's, it was really eye opening. Thank you so much. Thank you too. It's been an absolute pleasure. I love what you all are doing. Please let your students, your faculty, your staff, any and all people know that I'm accessible. Um, I believe in the work that we do individually as well as collectively, and I'm willing to partner at any point in time to make sure that we continue to center people. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, bye, sir.